Uh, we have two slides with our pictures on it, in case you couldn't see us up here. So uh, today, Clint and I are going to be talking to you about direct primary care networks, what they are, how to evaluate them, and how to work with them. Um, and we recently uh, started a product called Hint Connect, which is a DPC network, um, soon to be nationwide. Um, and so my background is in health plan contracting, and I know that's not like a popular background here uh, at the FMA MA conference, but I came from a place of wanting to use payment systems and primary care to affect change in the health system. And after seven or eight years um, working with providers on value-based contracting and um, reporting to them about how they're doing, what I saw was there were awesome primary care groups out there who did really well in risk because they were awesome, because they were focused on the, the patient and they treated their providers well. And there were lots of uh, PCPs out there who were part of big systems and the dollar, the amount that they were getting for risk was so insignificant compared to uh, the fee-for-service incentives and the bonuses that they would get from uh, referring care into the big systems that, yes, they took risk in name only, really. Um, so when I came to Hint, I was really excited about direct primary care and, you know, really putting the doctor-patient relationship back in place. Um, so my role there is to help businesses implement DPC um, so that anyone who has employer-sponsored coverage can get DPC. Now you. Thanks, Beth. Uh, so I'm Dr. Clint Flanagan. Uh, feel free just to call me Clint. Uh, and um, the word DPC has been said a lot today. And for those of us that have been doing this for a long time, it, I think it just is, um, you know, it's the world we live in, right? But I'd like to just step back for a second. And for those that are new to that term, direct primary care. So that's some, understand it's a model that, um, really it was designed by physicians for our patients. And, and so uh, if you're hearing that term this weekend for the first time or you're kind of new to it a little bit, just please know that, okay? So essentially it was a, a, a doctor is kind of peppered across the country. Jay showed a few of them today, including Vic Wood. Like I remember this guy from West Virginia and then obviously Garrison Bliss. And, and back then, um, this is back for me around 2000 nine or so over a decade ago, it, it was a bit of a lonely place because there were a, a few of us and we didn't quite know each other yet, um, but we knew we had to do something different. So I've been a doctor for over 20 years and in, in my background, I'm uh, board certified in family medicine. I, I've been a partner in a multi-specialty group of 50 docs in the Boulder County area in Colorado. I then joined uh, the largest provider of healthcare in our state, a huge healthcare system. And then I went on to own my own primary care practices, which to this day, I still own a separate fee-for-service primary care business that contracts with insurance, et cetera. Um, and uh, just very directly, we're not riding on that horse into the sunset. Uh, it, it, there's a time where we'll put that, that, will, that will stop. Um, separately, uh, we have NextEra Healthcare. So, the reason I give you that background a little bit is we're tremendously familiar with fee-for-service medicine. Uh, and it's a model that kind of maybe like many of you that aren't doctors that were kind of born into the systems you're working in and saying, gosh, there's need for change. It's a model that I don't know one doc out there that wrote about that in their med school essay. Like, I want to be a billing and coding guru <laughs> and, and take a third of, to half of my day keystroking this computer because uh, I think that's really going to help my patient. The model is um, really, really challenging, and, and, and doctors have a continual ethical and moral dilemma daily as they're working in that model because they're trying to bill and code, and, and it's just really, really unusual and weird. So we create a solution. Back in the day when, when we were doing this in Colorado, we were the first to do it, and I didn't even know what DPC was. We just called it monthly membership medicine. I had a lot of friends that did concierge medicine, and, and they do, do a great job, but the, the fee for that's quite high. And we kind of wanted to take care of the whole community. So we set our fees pretty low, and to this day, the $99 that we set for the first employee or first family member uh, is still 99 bucks a decade later. Now, we've changed a little bit our pricing for dependent, for spouse, partner, uh, dependents, kids, 
but the other price is still 99. Like who, who can say that in healthcare, right? And we're able to run a profitable business. Uh, so f fast forward to uh, here recently, we moved kind of from a couple of clinics uh, in Colorado to we have close to 40 locations in Colorado now, close to 80 locations across the country. Uh, and our patients like us, they don't leave, number one. And then number two, um, uh, their employer, which in our case, 84% of our members are employers, they, they stay on. And value has been talked a lot about today. Uh, I think one way to look at value is, is your consumer, in our case, the employer is still paying us. And through the pandemic, every single one of them bid. And all of them renewed from 2021 to 2022. So there's your data. <laughs> I love that nugget right there. Everything else is more complex as you get into data. But if you want a data nugget, is your consumer still paying you? So we're having a ton of fun. Our patients like it. We call them members, not patients. And then also um, uh, uh, the employers like it. And the other important piece here is the doctors like it. The healthcare team likes it. There, there's a lot of, that has been designed in our dysfunctional healthcare ecosystem. And they kind of forgot about the healthcare providers and teams that take care of these people. So we designed something that, that truthfully, back in the day, we, we were like, we could throw spaghetti at the wall and do better. But it turns out it's, it's a pretty cool thing. And to hear lots of DPC today is, is, is really cool for a lot of us that were um, very much uh, um, early in this movement. Uh, yes. <laughs> when? I'm not sure. Beth's driving that, but yeah. Why not go ahead? Uh, sure. So the members, the doctors, the employees, they all like it. Do you have metrics around that? How do you me measure those types of things to say that? There are a variety of ways, but one's net promoter scores, and we're typically in the 80s. We can get deeper into that question later, but um, I mean, directly, if they didn't like it, they don't. It's month to month, okay. they leave. Like, if you don't like the gym, you know, you go find another gym, but when they come on board, they, they stay. So that's, that's one way, uh, is net promoter scores. Go ahead. Awesome. So that's who we are. That's what DPC is. So what's a DPC network and why do they exist? Why do you need them? And you're on, on point for this one too. Yeah. So we, uh, I think are maybe one of the first, if not the first physician groups in the country to set up a DPC network. And we, had a lot of friends to help us do this, uh, including uh, legal uh, uh, friends and business people, et cetera. The target for us years ago was we wanted to take care of more than just a, a, a few people in the zip code that we were in. And I'm a huge fan of small business. And so we started taking care of plumbers and electricians and guys that are HVAC technicians, et cetera. And then we, through that, process uh, at that time figured out that a lot of employers, A, don't, companies less than 50, a lot of them don't offer any health benefit. And then for those that do offer some health benefit, truthfully, the question is, how much of a benefit is that, right? So we start asking, are you happy with your care to employers and you're happy with your spend? And almost always the answer, regardless of the crowd that we're talking to, is uh, no and no. So we're like, we can help solve for that. Um, so what happened in that case back, and this is years ago, is there weren't any other DPCs in Colorado. So we just talked to our private primary care physician friends in different zip codes that own their own practice. And the way that network started out back then was a, a kind of a handshake. <laughs> These were colleagues of mine that I knew really well, and I'm like, you know, there's no cost. Can you help us out? And I, I sure could use some help because I have some employees that live in your catchment area. So that's the way it started, and then now that has turned into, uh, I think it's a 50-page contract that affiliates sign with us. You know, in, in NextEra, uh, we kind of do the heavy lifting. So we do the business development, the sales, the legal, the marketing, the accounting, uh, and, uh, in, and it started uh, in Colorado, but then we had a, a employer that had locations across the country. So they liked what they saw in Colorado, and they said, hey, can you take care of our employees in these other places? So we went down that process of um, being able to do that, and then as you move into different states, you gotta make sure your employer agreements, and your member services agreements, and all this detail um, uh, is okay, or okay enough. Um, the Direct Primary Care Coalition's been super helpful with that, helpful with that on, on, on many fronts. So we set this up, and so what you see now today uh, is uh, up close to 80 locations. Technically, uh, I own about 10% of those locations, 
and I employ doctors and teams that are in those locations. The other rest, the majority, are physicians that are typically direct primary care physicians, uh, and they may have a patient panel of four or 500 people, and maybe I have 50 people in their catchment area, and so those 50 can get attached to that doctor. And what's kind of cool that's happened over time is uh, many of these physicians have been in these communities for years. So when it comes to like network, right? Like they go to church on Sunday with uh, patients they're taking care of. They, you know, buy tacos at the Comida Cantina. They, they, uh, their kids play football. You know, no, it's all this community uh, detail that is pr pretty cool because they're, they're, they're very invested in the community. And they're also very well aware of the physicians in those communities. And so we really have a bend towards sending our patients to or private specialty colleagues, whether it's ortho or cardiology or urology, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those are very, um, you know, they're kind of organic relationships, I'd say. We really try to keep our patients out of the big healthcare systems, although we play friendly with them uh, a little bit, but we, we try to keep our patients out of those places. And then as this goes even further, like to, I call it kind of the next version is, is now you get into direct contracting. So we get a vasectomy for, uh, actually, I think Corey was talking about a vasectomy earlier. Uh, for us, I think it's $600 or $700. You know, we, we have direct pay pricing, and Dr. Keith Smith uh, uh, is legendary in this arena. And truthfully, a lot of us DPC docs will educate our GI friends and our ortho friends because they won't necessarily know the price of a hernia repair, but we'll uh, show them Keith's price and we'll say, can you match it? Otherwise, I'm gonna get my patient on a plane and send him down to Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, so it's been a lot of fun with the affiliate network because there's a lot of organic uh, uh, pieces in that that is um, where the docs are in the communities and super well connected. Much different than us just putting a box up and hiring the doc from outside that community, uh, which which we can do that too. But it needs to make sense on a lot of fronts, and we always prefer to to use our direct primary care physicians that are in that network. So so hopefully that gives you a, a little slice of what that means. And again, we like to use the word next era healthcare community um, versus network, but. We'll use network for today. We'll use network for today. And from the Hint Health side, what we, you know, we started, we have technology that powers networks that allows practices to connect with other practices without a third party involved. And so we have almost 30 networks running on Hint. Some are two clinics. So some are, uh, you know, one practice on this side of town and the other practice on this side of town saying, together we can serve bigger employers. And some are like Nextera or PHP where, you know, they, they have a whole kind of um, presence in one certain area and then a geographic reach that goes nationally. Um, so there are a lot of types of DPC networks out there. Um, some are provider-led, some are business-led, um, and you know, they're, you, when you're working with them, as Clint said, they're taking on a lot of the administrative work for you, both as an employer and as a provider receiving life. So you don't have to do that marketing. Um, you, you don't have to go out and get that really difficult multi-year multi employer contract. Um, so they're adding a lot of value, but they also can be really different. Um, I'm going to go through some statistics that we are seeing about networks from our DPC Trends Report that you may have heard Zach talk about earlier. And then um, Clint and I are going to talk a little bit about how to evaluate networks given the prolif recent prolifer, prolifer you know, there's a lot lately. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, how to work with good ones and make sure that you are getting the experience that you want. So employers using DPC, employers are the foundation of why we need networks. Because if you're dealing with a direct-to-consumer offering, you don't need to offer direct-to-consumer outside of your catchment area. Uh, you know, last time we measured, 2017, there were about 250 employers running through Hint OS software. Today, there are over 4,000. So in the past five years, over 4,000 businesses have raised their hand and said, yes, I want to work with DPCs. And the, dark, the darker blue the bar, I know that some of the numbers here are, are, are pretty small, but the darker blue the bar, the smaller the employer. So most DPCs are working with really small employers, definitely the under 50, a lot of under 10s in their, in their, uh, their communities who understand the value of working with independent practices. Um, it's easy, kind of easier to implement DPC when you don't have a whole other plan that you're working with. But there are, as you can see in the lighter blue bars, a lot of, of employers over 100 and over 250 that are working with DPCs now. 
and they account for over half of the live employer lives that we see running through the Hint OS platform. And almost 50% of the lives that DPC are seeing in the HinOS platform are from employers. So that means that a lot of them are from big employers. And to serve big employers, you need a network. Because e even if you could serve from a catchment area every single employer, every single employee from an employer, that can put a DPC's business at risk because it, you're really over leveraged with one employer. So that's where networks come in in terms of spreading out that membership and also serving it well. When we roll, so DPC networks existed before Hint Health had our DPC technology, as Clint will tell you, uh, because you helped us build it and told us what you needed. Uh, so when we started in 2019, DPC networks were in, and I can't read, I think about 20 states. In two years, they're now in 40 states. So that is just a huge growth and a kind of a testament to the model that uh, networks are, are what is going to allow larger and more spread out businesses to implement DPC. And I think this is especially accelerated because of the pandemic, because people are now working from everywhere. You don't need, you know, there's always been companies that have a, a headquarters one place and a plant another place, or an industry like um, trucking or transportation where you have people on the road. But now even office workers don't have to go into the office or live further out into the suburbs, even if they do have to come into the office every once in a while. And so the spread of employees makes it difficult for one DPC clinic to serve an employer. So networks are, are a way that DPCs partner together to serve those types of employers. And networks are awesome for DPCs, independent DPCs as well. So not every DPC wants to be a network and have employer deals, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to receive employer lives and grow that way. And when we look at growth rates of DPCs who are affiliates of networks versus those who are not affiliates, we see their practices being stronger, healthier, and growing faster because of the lives that they're receiving as part of their network relationships. So evaluating DPCs, you know, what is the value add? I think we've, we've heard a lot today about, you know, when you're on the free market, you have to be able to clearly explain what your value prop is and add value for the price that you're charging. So when you're paying for a, a monthly membership to a network, you're typically going to be paying an administrative fee and you're going to be paying for the healthcare services. So you, the questions that you're going to be asking are, you know, or that the DPC network is going to be telling you are, you know, this is where I am. This is where I have providers. Uh, these are the administrative services I offer. I can do the technology, billing. I can do reporting. Um, I'm going to have customer service. Um, I'm going to tell you what healthcare services that we provide. So it's going to be DPC. It's, you're going to get unlimited primary care. We're going to be available 24-7. Um, and, you know, we're going to tell you who's using us. We're going to tell you how we're managing members with chronic disease. These are all things that uh, DPCs are going to be, DPC networks are going to be telling you. Um, but the things that you should also be asking are kind of what's under the hood. So if you're paying, you know, $99 to a DPC network, how much is the, of that is going to the, um, the provider? And is it a fair price? And if you're a provider evaluating a DPC network, that's a really fair question for you to ask too. Um, because I think what, in the, the spirit of DPC, the spirit of direct care is that transparency. Um, and we see networks that are charging an unfair administrative price on top of the DPC fee and not giving the doctor kind of the, the amount that they need to serve a member. And that is a replication of the fee-for-service healthcare system. Um, and I know because I was in it, and I know when an independent provider would come to our health plan and say, hey, can I participate? It was, this is the rate. It doesn't matter what you do. Take it or leave it. Um, so that's not what we want to replicate with networks at all. Um, and then who's the leadership? Uh, Clint, why don't you take this one? Because you're really passionate about kind of DPC providers being in charge of DPC networks. Yeah. Um, so... There can be a variety of people that are that, that are involved in that executive team, um, and our bias is it's really important to have a physician involved uh, in preferably if it can be a DPC physician that's involved in helping lead that organization. Um, and, and so now that I've said my bias, um, 
you know, you compare and contrast, right? And I think there's a lot in the healthcare ecosystem where you don't have physicians involved in these executive decisions. And as a result, uh, the patients uh, potentially suffer, the community suffers, and the spend is tremendous. And, and uh, uh, Zach had a, that, you know, picture of the pie and the rocket, right? Like a trillion dollars should be, you know, helping pay for our kids' football lessons and buying groceries and paying our bills and investing and doing other things, not being spent in healthcare, a trillion. And so, you know, we take an oath as physicians to do no harm to our patients. And you'll hear a lot of us in DPC talk about, like, we really take that a second step, but we want to do no financial harm to our patients because they're being harmed every day, right? So when you have uh, doctors and providers that are in leadership positions in these networks, it, it makes a huge difference. Dr. Eric Crawl down in Florida, you, you got uh, Strata and the Besmers uh, in Omaha. Um, you've got uh, doctors involved in decision making, and, and that's, I think, really, really important. I'll tell you, there's a lot being created out there where there is no doctor, and they're calling themselves DPC. So if any of you are in that position where you're wondering, gosh, is this a DPC network? Uh, feel free to call me directly. Uh, feel free to reach out to the Direct Primary Care Coalition. Feel free to talk to Beth, right? Because there is some opportunity here, let's say, and with, with opportunities like that in a free market, you get all kinds of interesting players. And so, um, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's really important. Um, if you look at hospitals, that have physician leadership, uh, they, they typically do a little bit better, uh, at least on the patient side. Um, so so that, that would be my, my bias. And, and, um, and if they're saying them, themselves a DPC network, please ask us. I'll tell you, uh, there are entities, huge entities, that provide employer care, and they um, are calling themselves direct primary care. Uh, I'm sure a fair amount of you would know who some of these entities are. I won't say names, but uh, it's impressive. So I guess it's kind of flattering, maybe. A little bit of us DPCers like, wow, gosh, I guess this huge company is calling themselves DPC now. But it's like, what's underneath the hood? You know? And in general, it's pretty simple. We have a contract with the employer. The employer pays NextEra Healthcare directly. We pay doctors that see patients, and we want the majority of that dollar to go to the doctor, kind of on a per member, per month basis. So it's not complicated uh, uh, calculus here. It's, it's pretty direct, uh, hence the term direct primary care. Yep, and so I'd add, you know, there's two ways that networks get evaluated, both from who's purchasing them, employers, TPAs, plan sponsors, and also from the providers who are participating with them. And as a provider, you have to ask as well, what are the expectations? So sometimes you're in a, a network's catchment area and you could be receiving 20, 50 patients, a good portion of your panel, because that's mainly where the network is selling. In other cases, you have kind of a, a branch or kind of a long arm, and it, you might get expect two or five members. And so just understanding those expectations up front so you don't end up two years down the road saying, well, I only got five members, and the network's saying, well, you were only supposed to get five members. I'm not selling in you know, your, your area directly, um, and just making sure the expectations are clear up front. And then because this is a more complicated contractual arrangement, there's a contract with the provider and there's a contract with the employer, I just so encourage everyone to read the contract language. And contracts are written in fine print for a reason because they are, a lot of times they contain things that you, you know, do not favor the person signing them. And anyone can understand a contract if you have enough time, you have a highlighter, and you really try to parse it out. And if you have a question about what is in a contract, you should ask about it and make sure that you understand clearly what you're signing up for. Because this is a big deal for providers, this is a big deal for employers, it's a big commitment. Um, so understanding that fine print is really important. Clint, what else? What are we missing in terms of evaluating a, a DPC network? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of different lenses to think about. What, one is the employer, maybe you're the benefits advisor broker that's evaluating it. Uh, two is the physician. Um, and I'll tell you in the DPC world, that there, there's docs that are just starting up, you know, and they're wanting to grow their patient panel, plus they're also wanting to learn. And, and we have a, a, a lot of fun with that. Once a month we have a webinar and our docs from all across the country 
um, we get on Zoom or uh, Teams or one of those services. And, and, and usually there's an agenda and there's some Q&A at the end. Uh, and it's great to be able to get together because sometimes um, if you're just, let's say, a solo doc in a, in a smaller town, you, you might not have the expertise or the resources, uh, and we sure want to help out on that front. So we can drill right down to things like we have a nationwide contract with LabCorp. In Colorado, we have contracts across the state with our imaging centers. Uh, we have direct pay rates, I said, like with a specialist. So let's say you're a, you know, in your first six to 12 months as a physician opening up your DPC practice and you're, you, you got a lot of work to do. And rather than go out and pioneer those relationships yourself, a lot of times you can come on board with us and we've already pioneered the relationships. And because of our size and leverage, we have some pretty um, good discounts on a variety of things. Um, in addition to that, uh, physical therapy, behavioral health, et cetera. We also really try to help them um, with, with the business side and whether that's negotiating a lease, um, doing a tenant improvement on the space that they're in, whether that is, uh, you know, all the different things that you have to do, owning your own practice, we're happy to help with that and, uh, and, and have a lot of expertise on that front. Um, so that's for the physician side, um, as well as the HR, or in a lot of smaller practices, you just, you know, you have one person up front that wears a lot of hats, and it's the doctor. Uh, it, the, and sometimes it's the doctor up front. Some of our practices are like that. Sometimes the doctor's back seeing patients, they're wearing a lot of hats, so we want to help. You know, we connect our front office manager with their front office manager. We connect our nursing with their nursing, right, to, to help them along that pathway on those day-to-day -day operational decisions. Um, the other piece is just an employer, right? So um, if there are employers in the room, I would just say first and foremost, if your benefits advisor is not talking to you about um, non-status quo solutions, um, uh, at this conference, I'm sure you could find a number of benefit advisors that would talk to you about some uh, options where A, better care and potentially even more affordable, right? So uh, really good on the employer's side to know that there are a lot of solutions that aren't, gosh, is this proof of concept, is this going to work? I mean, we've been doing this for over a decade. So that's the employer's side, then, of course, the benefits broker side. So as they're evaluating a network, what does that mean? What's behind uh, uh, the door there? And, and it's really important to understand that, evaluate that, and then how is that going to be set up? There, I've seen a variety of ways uh, that that is set up from a business or financial. Um, again, we're not insurance companies. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so part of that is, gosh, if you're a benefits advisor broker, the traditional ways of getting paid is you're kind of getting paid by the buka, right? There's some different ways to have those business relationships, and there are entities like Health Rosetta that do a great job of talking about different ways. Uh, I'm not saying they're the only solution, but um, fortunately there are different ways to have that relationship and show your value versus working for an employer as a benefits advisor broker getting paid by the buka. So I think what you just said about kind of showing your value takes us really nicely into the last part of our talk, which is the Digital Globe Max our case study. And so uh, talk about, tell us about kind of working with an employer that made you reach into a network and how you expanded that relationship with them. Yeah, so uh, this is one of our, we have a lot of fun chapters um, and, and this is a, one that the company before a merger and acquisition was called Digital Globe, and they have expertise in taking pictures uh, up from the, with, with their satellites, uh, and they contract with our federal government on the military side. They contract with Google and Facebook, et cetera. So their satellites are cruising around about 700 miles up and taking pictures, and they're a world leader in it. Uh, there was an M&A that happened. Now the company's called Maxar, and they um, do everything from take pictures to uh, the Sirius XM. You guys listen to that, Sirius XM is a Maxar satellite. So this is a pretty cool company, definitely different than like the craft beer companies we take care of. A uh, multi-billion dollar company uh, headquartered in Denver, world headquarters are there. And we did a pilot and they said, uh, hey, we like the pilot um, of what you're doing. They were self-funded, uh, United's a TPA, uh, Optum Express Scripts or so is the PBM, uh, Willis Towers, I'm sorry, Hub International was the broker. Uh, and their leadership uh, wasn't looking necessarily to save money. So their leadership was looking to provide better primary care. And most of the people that work for this company are like master level, PhD level engineers. And they had uh, you know, your traditional uh, Cadillac PPO type plans and they were frustrated because they couldn't get in to see the doctor. So this is unique in that fact that you know, they had, let's say best of the best uh, prior to us coming in and they weren't satisfied with it. 
and they also had a huge two or 300,000 square foot office building, uh, their headquarters with no on-site clinic. And so we proposed that to them as well. So the relationship started off with just taking care of Colorado. Then they said, hey, can you take care of all of our other locations across the country? And that's kind of where, um, fortunately, we had already had a bit of a, a network program, let's say, in play. And we expanded to other states. Um, and we did all of that within uh, six months or so. Uh, and we showed up at open enrollment meetings in October, November, and CARE started January 1. So that was a fun conversation with their leadership of saying, hey, can you do that? And, uh, and I said yes, and then uh, went out the door, my hair on fire a bit, and called a bunch of DPC friends, <laughs> said, okay, guys, can we, can we put this together? Fast forward to today, we, 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 we've been having a lot of fun and, and, um, and have helped decrease their spend because there's less ER visits, less urgent care visits, less hospital stay, less elective procedures, less elective imaging, uh, and um, save them. Uh, I think the data that's up there was just data that coming out of the initial uh, case study that we did with the uh, couple, two or three hundred lives. This company has, I think, around six or seven thousand employees. Uh, so um, it's a lot of stuff that you'll hear about DPC that a lot of us DPCers know. But you know, in short, you get access to your primary care physician and make it unlimited. And next thing you know, lots of cool things start happening. Why? Because that doctor can take care of ninety plus percent. Well, that's a great question, and so part of that is we call it engagement, uh, and and uh, there are many steps along that pathway. Step one is uh, uh, is the company um, going to offer direct primary care, <laughs> and if they decide that they want to, then typically we made a kind of RMO to go to open enrollment meetings and go with physicians. So, as a recovering fee-for-service doctor with contracts with Blues and Cigna and Anthem. How many times did I go to open enrollment meetings? Never. Like that was a weird, you, you would never as a fee-for-service doc think of that. It's just you're, you're at arm's length because of this third party. They sent non-clinical people who knew nothing like me to open enrollment meetings. Yeah. So, some that, of, so the me. benefit, the, our, our, our broker benefit friends, like they, they, it's a great relationship because Usually, they're not super keen on going to those anyway, and we get up, the doctors get up and talk to the employees they're going to take care of, right? Like, novel concept. <laughs> here's what you're paying for, here's what you get, uh, and, and it's been fun. Like, I think back to a trucking company we take care of with, like, 500 truckers. Like, you know, we were doing curb consults right there in open enrollment meeting. You know, they're coming up and, and talking to us about sleep apnea, et cetera. So engagement is really, really important, right? So uh, what we have found is that companies typically pay 100% of the benefit. So that kind of makes it easy, but then the employee's kind of like, well, what's the catch? Wait a minute, I have unlimited access and I can connect to the doctor? Wait, I can text the doctor? Like, they, you start offering all these things and they're super skeptical about it because they, they're like, what's the catch? Like, when does this good stuff kind of end? Or I'm gonna be woke up because they're used to being a traditional fee-for-service patient. So we continually, continually educate, take every opportunity that we can to educate. And then once they came on board, we didn't say you had to leave your PPO United Denver doctor, maybe they had a great relationship with that doc. So we're like, hey, if you want to take yourself or your kids to the well child check once a year with that insurance doc, go for it. And I'll be your doctor the other 364 days out of the year when your preventative health plan uh, benefit goes to zero, right? Like you, you see that word preventative and, and that's, I don't know if doctors came up with that. I would think not because I think it's probably an insurance term preventative and non-preventative, right? Is it a preventative visit or non-preventative? Insurance plans are kind of uh, marketed as, oh, you're preventative. Well, really it's like one visit a year. And we like to say what we do in DPC is kind of like a gym membership. And if you're not going to the gym, you're not going to get much benefit. So it's a whole paradigm shift of, oh, I'm healthy. I don't need to go to the doctor. Like we made it our mission at Nextera to say, one, we want you to have a good experience, and two, we want to help get you to optimal health. So that's different than what we were doing in fee-for-service medicine, because in that bucket, we're, we're billing and coding for disease state. So, you know, it, 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 it's, um, it also is a, to your point, it was a, it's always been a voluntary benefit. Um, and so that's kind of interesting, too. The employees opt in. Um, and what we see over time is employees talk about the care they're getting, so they tell their other employee friends, and 
And you would think even with an opt-in where the company is paying 100%, you'd think you'd have 100% buy-in. But you know, people check the same box every year, so you have to educate when it comes to their health benefit options. So I'm not sure how much more time we have because I know we got started late, but now is the time for Q&A. So if you have more questions, Um, and 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 the, the comment maybe you want to react to is that you know uh, a couple of years ago Jeff Bezos paid, paid 250 million dollars to the Washington Post and then last year um, One Medical paid 2.1 billion dollars to buy Iora, a direct primary care practice, to do a network PPC. So, um, but some people question the value because you haven't been able to share a lot of data like this, and then some people just say, hey, if your patient isn't paying you directly, you're not DPC. Um, what are you, how do you react to that question? Yeah, so uh, just at a high level, we're, we're super focused on patients getting care. And at times, I could almost be like a little agnostic into who's paying for that, right? Like we, um, in our case specifically, 84% of our members, the employer pays for that employee to get care with us. And some of these companies are like, we take care of restaurants and, and it's a waiter or a waitress, right? Like they might not be in a position where they could afford that monthly uh, uh, payment. Uh, so we're really, I mean, how many people need DPC? I, it's about 300 million people, right? And so who's gonna pay for that? Uh, Medicaid, uh, maybe, Medicare, Pilots going on right now, ACO reach, and then you know 150 million Americans get their benefit from their employer, and so we we um, really like when we go into those employer relationships for the employer to pay at least 100 percent for the employee, whether or not they pay for the dependents kind of up on them. Most of our companies do, um, and then all of a sudden you start to have lots of primary care happening. Uh, so you, you know. If it was really direct, I get the argument, it'd be the employee paying with their own money for it. But if we're gonna, in our case, we've always kind of been hell-bent on taking care of employers. And so, so in our case, we're, we, we have a bias towards, if the employer wants to pay for it, sure. And then we look at everything else the employer's paying for, wellness stuff, uh, a whole slew of things, we start to, let's say work as healthcare consultants for them and start to say, hey, maybe you don't need to pay this third party to come in and do your biometric screening. We'll take care of that where your doctors. Uh, maybe we'll handle all your worker comp. Dr. Roger talked about that today. We do work comp for companies. So all these other things that we can add as value. Uh, and uh, so kind of a long answer to your question, Jay, but um, we're okay with employers paying us directly. I would also add that what we see in terms, and what, what Clint said about benefit design is DPC is almost always an elective benefit, so people are opting in, so that it's not being forced on them. And then I think almost every DPC, if not every DPC that I know, is having members who are employer-sponsored sign their patient care agreement. So they're signing the contract with the DPC because it's a two-way street. If you, it is a time commitment to be a DPC patient because you, it's, a doctor can't make you have optimal health. You have to be part of that journey as well and want to be there. And so, uh, you know, the really good education during open enrollment and then signing the DPC's practice agreement as if you were a direct pay patient, I think, you know, cover some of that ground. How do they make money? Which, is, which person's they? Uh, how does the DPC physician make money? Is that the direct question? Yeah, so uh, it's a monthly membership fee that's charged. I think the average per member per month across the country, give or take, is around $70. And a DPC doc will talk about maybe having 500 to 1,000 patients in their panel. So if you kind of take that number, um, let's call it for easy math, 600 patients, $70 multiply that, you see what the monthly is, then you see what your annual is, and then you, uh, let's, overhead is less. Overhead is less than a DPC practice versus a fee-for-service practice, billing and all that fun stuff. Um, so at least 10 to 20% less. So now you can start to see, oh, I, I just wanna be a DPC doc and have 500 patients and take care of them. Most, give or take, the, the average fee-for-service primary care physician in this country has a panel of patients. Uh, anybody know, non-doctors, what approximately that bucket of people 
is that a Kaiser doc or a Banner doc or a blue, you know, if he, insurance doc take care, takes care of? 5,000. That's, that's a little on the high end. Um, I've hired one doc in all our years, Dr. Charles. Uh, he had 5,300 patients in Boulder. The average is about 2,500 patients, give or take. Uh, so imagine that 2,500 patients, and now you're taking care of five or 600, and you go from seeing 30 patients a day, which is what I used to do, you know, hamster wheel, uh, to seeing 10 or so, and imagine so we can now, as doctors, spend a half hour to an hour with our patients, and I'm not having to think about billing and coding. Like, I could just sit down and have a relationship. The gentleman that did the keynote was awesome. You know, we're not, we're, you know, everybody, it's innovative and all that stuff. We're restoring the doctor-patient relationship, right? Mm -hmm. People use the word disrupting. I'm like, we're restoring something. The innovative part to support that is the business model. So uh, uh, average primary care doc in this country maybe makes, I don't know, 180 grand or 200 grand, give or take, depending upon zip code. Uh, in DPC, you can do that, if not more. And truthfully, I think all my DPC friends should be paid more than orthopedists. It would be my bias <laughs> but for the value we provide. But uh, you, know, you, you can make a, a healthy living. And a really good slide that Hint showed was when you're part of that DPC network, you can grow your practice more. I mean, every patient's revenue monthly. Um, so hopefully that gives a little bit of color to your question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Rod Stroy. Uh, I'm also, I know we have uh, about 2,500 members in our clinic with four providers. Uh, uh, we have not participated in a network at this point. One of the questions that you ask is, is a network like an like a insurance network where if you're traveling? No. Okay, <laughs> Thank you. But, but the network has that connotation, that sense that you can bounce from practice to practice. I, yeah, so I, I think I see where you're getting at. Um, so education, 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 and, and where the, uh, the relationship is important between the physician and the, and the member. And we, you know, people are like, oh, you, you have 40 locations, can I see any of those docs? I'm like, no, this isn't urgent care. We want you to see Dr. Smith in Grand Junction. He's awesome. But if you happen to be, um, like literally right now, I'm thinking of a case, uh, I've got a patient down in uh, Florida uh, that's relocated from Boulder down to Florida, and he's wondering if we, he can use the Tampa location to get blood drawn. So there are kind of some of those few little things that hardly ever comes up, though, where they are trying to pop into another clinic or so. We tell them very directly, call your doctor, your team, for just about everything. Uh, have there been circumstances over the years where they connected to one of, there's been a little bit of that noise, but um, we really want them to be connected. And then it's always the patient's choice on the physician they select. So we've had circumstances where, you know, they, they meet a physician and they're like, you know, I, I think I want to have a different one. Totally fine. We do not, uh, and once they attach to that doc is when we start paying them the per member per month. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit. And the piece of that too is it, it just helps diversify your lane as a revenue. We have 30 businesses that we work with. One of them is new to us, and they, they moved to our location instead of shop. They already have an existing location in mm -hmm. Vancouver, Washington. And mm -hmm. in Vancouver, Washington, they have a large pool of employees. Why not have, instead of uh, asking for help to understand why, why develop or encourage them to join a network through him rather than just have that location form directly with that DPC and this location? There's, I'll answer the first part. There's probably six different ways to do this six or seven or 10, right? But we've found over the years, dealing whether it's benefits advisor brokers or whether it's with the employer directly, like they want one contract, they want one price, give or take. We solve for that versus them having to cobble together this, that, and the other. Uh, so we, we solve for it. And, and if you think about something as simple as like flu shots, right? We do thousands, tens of thousands of flu shots. Like we're, we're handling that. You want flu shots as an employer? We'll go on site, we'll handle it. Here's the price, here's the invoice, you know. Just all that kind of operational stuff, when you have one point, um, it, it, it sure, I think from an employer standpoint and a benefits advisor broker, it's going to make it a little bit easier. That being said, they could do it a different way. Um, we, we've just kind of found that, uh, that the way that we're doing it works pretty good. Yeah, I would add to that, you know, direct contracts are fantastic, but at the employer level, like at, to expect someone in every single business to have the time and the knowledge to create multiple provider contracts, manage multiple relationships, and have the business take on the risk of providing a health service agreement themselves, what we see is two is the max. Most employers will 
contract with up to two DPCs, and after that, they're they're looking for another solution. So I think you know we support lots of multi-site DPCs, and if you can do it through multi-site, that's awesome. Um, but I think the network serves the function for employers who are like, I have one benefits person, and they can't manage multiple contracts. That you've been trying to ask a question, and I think we have time for one more. Uh, great question. I should have created some clarity uh, before then. So uh, Beth alluded to it a little bit before. Uh, so when we were smaller, you can imagine Jenny in the back office on Microsoft Outlook trying to do billing for um, members that are on Nextera. It wasn't quite exactly that, but you know we, we were handling it. In fact, we even tried to, we spent a lot of money trying to do our own software. So Hint is this, um, Hint's a lot of things, but the one thing that is very, very, very helpful, it's the engine behind all of our billing. So let's think of like Gold's Gym or 24-Hour Fitness, billing all those members. There's a certain point in time, some patients may use ACH, you know, checking your savings. Some patients may uh, use their credit card, credit card fails. Um, and, and or you may have an employer that has on a unique software like Workday, where they use paychecks, or maybe they built their own HR software, and you have employees coming off and on. So imagine if you could take into care of a, a company that's 5,000 employees uh, providing direct primary care for them, and you got employees coming off and on. So A, you need to bill the employer, and it has to be correct down to the penny. Then in our case, we have to pay the doctor in Florida, Wyoming, Nebraska. Like, that is no longer Jenny in the back office on Microsoft Excel. Right? And, and we pay Hint to help us with that service. It's part of, our, I guess you could say in one case, like our tech stack. Uh, and, and that relationship has allowed us to do what we do at NextEra. And like any kind of business, we've evolved, right? And, and uh, thank God we've got that behind the scenes. Otherwise, the amount of work that we would have to be doing that would take, care from, take away from doctoring would be uh, really, really large. So, so um, so, so that's a, a bit of what Hint, Hint does. They are, they're, they're, they're not physicians like direct primary care docs. They, they are a uh, uh, tech software company that yep. supports us in what we do, and it's a synergistic relationship. Yep. And Hint Connect uh, is a, a, our new offering, which is meant to be the glue between kind of networks that are out there, practices that are out there who want to work with larger employers, uh, kind of connecting those, if you saw Zach's talk before, kind of the connections between the small nodes and the big nodes to open up uh, direct primary care to really spread out for, for employers who don't have a Clint in their backyard or a PHP or even like, a, you know, a, a two doc network um, to be able to serve those members with DPCs who are in the community who want to work with employers. So I would just add to that, it's a bit of chicken and egg. Right, because it's like an employer comes to you and he's like, well, how many locations do you have? And we used to have two or three, <laughs> right? Now I can say to the employer, well, we have close to 80 or so, and you know, you have 500 people in Missoula, Montana, we'll put a clinic there. Like, we have that um, flexibility now to do that and to pioneer that, put up a new clinic or to contract with an existing DPC doc, like there's a lot of work involved in that. And so part of Hint Connect, which was a brilliant name, I'm not sure came up with that, but is another layer now of what Hint, Hint's already built a relationship with a ton of us DPC physicians. This is like, I'd say a bit of the evolution. And part of that is, like you can imagine, there might be a time where an employer comes to Hint Connect, um, who's run by an awesome uh, physician that, that I know, Dr. David Cameron, who I've known for years. So David is in the leadership role though, there with Hint Connect and is super familiar with DPC and DPC serving employers. So you can imagine like all the pioneering that's happening there to connect these different DPC docs and, and, and you know, that allows us to be more competitive in the marketplace. Some people have talked about rec replicability or scale or so that, that's what I mean, that's what we're doing here. Uh, and, and it's important to have physician leadership that are involved in those lanes and, and people on the team that are like-minded, good people rowing in the same direction. <laughs> All right, so I think we're being pulled off the stage, but uh, you know, we, Hinton has a booth here. You're welcome to come visit us. Clint's everywhere. You can literally call him to ask about DPZ Networks, so. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate it.